two years ago, I uploaded a video titled The Curious Decline of Communal Showers. Uh, that was a topic that I had been interested in for some time, and yet there was a great paucity of any kind of discussion uh, or analysis of that uh, cultural shift online. There is some. Uh, I found very little then, and I've found very little since, but it's a topic that's continued to interest me. And one of the things that I find interesting about it is that, uh, and I had kind of suspected this before I uploaded that video, that it wasn't just me who found the topic fascinating. And sure enough, that video has proven to be um, kind of one of the surprising uh, videos of, that I've uploaded in, the, in in terms of views, right? It gets consistent views uh, every day. There's always more people watching it, and it gets comments, uh, if not every day, nearly every day. Uh, and very often, rather um, heartfelt and extensive comments. People will oftentimes type paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after, after paragraph. So, you know, this is something that... Uh, if not everybody, it certainly touches a lot of people in a profound way, and a lot of people have pretty strong uh, feelings about it, which is mirrored my own experience. Uh, and I think that that's very interesting, and you compare that with the taboo with discussing it, or the paucity of discussion, or the fact that there is... I guess this is a maybe a more general thing, but there's there's this big shift that's happening in society, but that shift is almost entirely um, non-explicit, right? There we aren't having it. There never was an explicit movement away from communal showering. It's just happening, and uh, I've continued to be interested in it, and I've done more reading and research since then. So I thought I'd make an uploaded uh, kind of an updated uh, video. Uh, also, there was a decent amount of feedback on that that I want to address some of the stuff that came up. So first, I guess I want to kind of outline very briefly the history here of communal showering in, in the context of the United States. Uh, this history might be paralleled if perhaps offset in other countries in, in, in Europe and around the world, but this is definitely the one that I'm the most familiar with and it's the most relevant from my perspective. So um, obviously, Contextual public nudity has been part of just culture uh, since the beginning. There have always been uh, at least certain uh, circumstances where this would be deemed acceptable. And within the Western tradition, although segregation between the sexes has been a long-standing uh, reality and there's been uh, lots of... Uh, there, there hasn't been many situations where men and women would get naked together. Uh, certainly men, and in some cases, segregated women would. And for for men, uh, that would mostly be in bathing type situations, whether it was at a lake or at a river. Uh, men would, uh, if they went in a group, they would probably go naked. The growth of swimming wear, swimming trunks, covers is, is a much more recent phenomenon and one that was not really very common except in unisex environments. So, uh, again, people going to go swim in the local swimming hole or whatever uh, was the, the way that most people would swim. And if they were men, they would uh, go naked. If they were women, they would usually be covered up. Uh, if both sexes were present, then maybe both would cover up. There is apparently, and I've just learned this recently, there's been a lot of debate about whether uh, women would be present if men were going nude. So there is some evidence and this is a little bit later in the history of, of say, swimming competitions being held at public schools uh, where women are probably present in the in the attendance watching, um, but the, the, the boys are naked. And uh, there's situations where this seems to have been more or less tolerated. But in the 1870s, you have the first communal showers there created by the French army. I'll put a, that's just Wikipedia if you want to look it up, but I'll put a link in the description to it. Um, they were put in because it was thought to be more economical. I'll just read this very briefly. Uh, modern commuter sh communal showers were installed in the barracks of the French army in the 1870s as an economic hygiene measure under the guidance of Francois-Marie Delabeau, a French doctor and inventor. As Surgeon General at Bonneville Prison in Rouen, Delabeau had previously replaced individual baths with mandatory communal showers for use by prisoners, arguing that they were more economic and hygienic. The French system of communal showers was adopted by 
other armies, the first being the Prussian in 1879, and by prisons and other jurisdictions. They were also adopted by boarding schools before being installed in public bathhouses. The first shower in a public bathhouse was in 1887 in Vienna and Austria. In France, public bathhouses and showers were established by Charles Cazalet, first in Bourgeau in 1893, and then in Paris in 1899. And this movement, this public hygiene movement, which was in some ways inspired, inspired by uh, two things. One was the knowledge of classical Roman baths and Roman Greek baths. Uh, these were quite prominent in classical literature and people who were conversant in the classics were aware that this was a big part of Roman and Greek culture. And uh, since those societies are often directly emulated in the West uh, at various points in history, um, it was something that's not too surprising that they would draw inspiration from. The other inspiration was the Victorian uh, prophylactic uh, obsession with hygiene. So I've seen in my other videos where I've talked about circumcision, there was a period in the history of medical knowledge before the germ theory of, of medicine was uh, really understood or widely believed. Uh, there were several other stages before that. I mean, and people are more familiar with like the medieval idea of, of humors. Uh, but, you know, in the early 1800s, you had the belief in galvanism or the nerve theory of, of disease, which was that stimulation of the body. Uh, and in the context of uh, circumcision, the stimulation caused from masturbation caused disease. But then later, uh, they discovered that if you use clean imp implements of a surgeon, cleaned his, his scalpels and his knives and his, his butcher's tools, uh, sanitized them, that the uh, survival rates went way up. They also discovered that if you cleaned up cities, if you got rid of raw sewage or spittoons or uh, just did, had better drainage, that disease rates went down, right? So you wouldn't have as much typhoid fever or yellow fever or whatnot. And they didn't understand why that was, but there was just this association between cleanliness and health an association that is correlative but not causal uh, and this kind of combined with other victorian ideas to have this kind of uh, cleanliness craze which manifested surgically as circumcision both of boys and of girls actually and the actual although this is no longer common practice they also got into uh, removing other body parts appendices tonsils colons is used to, it used to be quite popular to do colonectomies because they were quote dirty um, and there was also a movement of public baths, as the article just there uh, indicated. And in the United States, there was a brief kind of public bath movement that, uh, you know, in the late 1800s. And then that never really caught on. By the 1920s, that was kind of the death throes of that. There were like public bath parks in, say, New York City and Chicago and other places. Uh, but those did not really catch on. But what did catch on was requiring bathing in schools. The first school district in the United States to require bathing, bathing was the Boston Public School System in 1900. Uh, and I don't, we don't have numbers, or at least I don't have numbers. But at least by the 20s or 30s, this would have become uh, almost ubiquitous in any school that could afford it. I imagine in the 20s and 30s there were schools that just logistically did not have shower facilities and maybe didn't have the necessary tax base to, to install them. But any of them that could, did. Uh, and these policies became uh, quite ubiquitous. And you have kind of, again, two parallel things going on here. On the one hand, you have just the showering for uh, gym classes and sports. And then you have the nudity associated with swimming and with pools. Now, again, not every school had a pool. I know I, even much later, I mean, I went to a high school that didn't have a swimming pool. Um, and I'm sure I, I, I kind of doubt that there was ever a period when a majority of the high, of the public schools in the country had them. But for those that did, uh, not only would showering be required before and after, but naked swimming in pools was required. And there's actually a really fascinating documentary that I'll put a link to called Naked Swimming in School that kind of details that. Uh, that is probably an even more um, extreme illustration of the cultural shift than just communal showering in general, but the idea that you would have uh, at least gender segregated class, uh, classes of boys swimming naked, not just in school, but at YMCA's, at boy clubs, at summer camps, whether it be a Boy Scout camp or church camp or whatnot. I was just reading online about a, a kid who related his 
his experience in the even as late as the early 80s of going to a Quaker camp that required uh, everyone to swim naked. All right, so you had you have that. Um, in 1926, the uh, Association of Athletics, oh, I'll get the name, uh, uh, basically advocated that uh, to keep pools clean, that men be required to swim naked. Uh, they did not recommend that for women. So there was this double standard that women, uh, they had kind of vague arguments that well, women were more modest, that there was more for women to be exposed to. And so uh, although women might still use the pools and still be expected to take a gym class, uh, they were expected to wear swimsuits, whereas men weren't. There were some, uh, I have read some reports of women also going nude, uh, but it was much less common. Uh, men going nude was nearly, nearly ubiquitous. Women going nude was less common. And of course, mixing them together was uh, highly unusual. That I can't say it never happened, but it would seem to be very, un very unlikely. So that was in 1926, and those became the guidelines for the really the next 40 to 50 years. Um, and again, just kind of a, a well, I mean, if you look back to the culture of the 50s or 40s or, or 60s, it's easy to 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 say, oh, it's a very different culture than we have today for lots of reasons. But I think this is one of the more extreme differences, right? We can we can kind of see, oh, yeah, they sell kids doing drugs and people listening to rock and roll, and they're still going to school like we go to school. Uh, but then, oh, there's the water polo team, and they're completely naked. And not only is, are they completely naked, it's totally normalized. Uh, one of the websites that I found, which archives just naked swimming, uh, very interesting. You know, they were pointing out like they found all these newspaper articles. And they cover this, but in a mundane way. Like these newspaper articles are not, oh my God, this is scandalous. What's the deal? Why are we doing this? Why do we permit this to be done? It was, you know, announcing to everyone, hey, uh, don't bring your suit to school because you need to swim naked. And they would even publish photographs of large, you know, like the high school swim team or the high school gym or whatever. Uh, famous photographs in Saturday Evening Post, for instance, in the 30s and 40s of a, an entire high school of uh, a locker room full of, of teenagers showering naked and nobody, no reaction of, oh my gosh, this is inappropriate or this is uh, disgusting or perverted. It was just, this is so normal that it didn't even um, broker any kind of reaction whatsoever, negative or positive. It was co just completely mundane. Um, in the 60s, you get the kind of the first stirrings of people saying maybe we shouldn't do this. But by and large, most school districts continue to do it. Uh, surveys of schools indicate that it was still two thirds and three quarters were still requiring uh, naked swimming in the pools, and a much larger percentage would have been required in showering before, uh, after gym class. Uh, and it's really kind of what the first event and a lot of people pointed this out in my previous video from two years ago and it's something that i hadn't considered before 1972 you get title nine and title nine really was the first big legal barrier to a lot of this going on because a lot of this was predicated on having uh single sex gym classes having a boys gym class and a girls gym class and schedule that no longer kind of became tenable in a, in a Title IX situation where uh, that just wouldn't be equal. Uh, and you couldn't have, uh, you had to have the same facilities. So it was all well and good if, if you had the sexes split, the men could have their locker room with their showers and you might not even have a, a girl's locker room or you might have one, but it would be much smaller because girls would not have been taking gym at near the rate as, as boys, uh, either because that's just how they felt or that's how the uh, curriculum of the school was set up, right? So it might have been mandated for boys, but not for girls. And suddenly now you have to integrate the two. And now a lot of the things that you could do before, you can't really do anymore. So you can't have the uh, men only gym class where the men are all swimming together uh, naked. You have to combine it with the girls. And that means that you have to wear suits, basically. Uh, now, this didn't in and of itself end communal showering. And as you'll as as I'll outline here, the naked swimming continued for more than a decade in many places. But this was kind of the start, the beginning of the end, as far as that concerned. 
You also get later in the 70s and in the, in the 80s, the first kind of sustained backlash on the part of, of, of students. Um, most of the recollections you get from older men who went in the 50s and, and most of the 60s, you don't see a lot of, uh, of, of kids uh, being upset or being shy. Um, if they were, they, uh, they internalized that in a way and they didn't really express it. By the 70s and, and then by the 80s, you have a, a growing number of um, kids who are vociferously against the practice and start doing a, whatever that protesting formally, you know, just non compliance uh, and even committing crimes. So they're famous, famously in Chicago, uh, you had students who would, you know, break glass bottles and throw them into the pool, necessitating uh, that the pool be drained. And then doing it again and again. Now these are misdemeanors. If the kids had been caught, they could have been in serious trouble. Uh, and yet they were willing to take that risk to avoid the entire naked situation, which is unprecedented. Now you could say that isn't necessarily an indication on nudity norms changing. It could just be that they're uh, less conformist. They're more anti-authoritarian. They're more right. It doesn't prove that that's the only possible motivational change. There could be others, uh, but you have a lot of testimony from gym teachers, from swimming coaches, from other coaches, football coaches, whatnot, saying that they started to have more and more kids who were objecting. Uh, and this continued, but all the way through the 80s, the, the showering in school uh, was still a basically ubiquitous rite of passage. And then in the very late 80s and early 90s, this very suddenly shifts. and. You'll, if you if you look, and I'll put links, in 1995 and 1996, you have the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Chicago Tribune all coming out with pieces saying that kids are no longer showering in school. Uh, now, I find it really interesting that all three of these major newspapers across literally the entire country come up with these articles uh, within a year of each other. Now, part of this might just be they're all copying the New York Times. I don't know if the dates... Uh, are such that they prove exactly when this happened. Uh, yeah, I didn't write down the exact dates, but they're all 1996. Uh, you know, which is which is fascinating that it was that sudden uh, that it just the mid 90s this has happened, and this this uh, this coincides with my anecdotal experience. I started sixth grade in 1995, ended in 1996, uh, and I growing up in middle school was aware that the middle school and high schools and in, in my local town had communal showers and that they were being used we were told as much by our parents by older siblings by older uh, friends of ours we were told by our elementary school gym teacher that we would need to get you know as we started to get older fourth and fifth grade we started sweating more uh he would allude like hey you know i i wish that we were in middle school because then i could make you guys get clean because you're dirty uh that sounds creepier than i think it was was really invented from his point of view uh, and you know I'll be honest like I was completely terrified of this eventuality uh, you know the idea of, of having to get naked in front of my friends uh, it literally was the most terrifying thing on my social horizon there was nothing other Soviet Union had collapsed you know we weren't worried about nuclear war anymore terrorism hadn't really started wasn't really a thing this was the big concern and uh, when I got to middle school, the gym teacher was new. It was his first year or his second year, and he never even said the word shower. He never. I mean, I kept every time he blew his whistle, and it said in the syllabus, right? So that there still were communal showers in the facilities. Our syllabus said that students were required to bring their own towel and their own shower supplies. So that definitely implied that showering was was an expected part of of the curriculum. Although it certainly didn't say that it was mandated anywhere. And uh, so I dutifully did that. I didn't want to be forced to shower and not be prepared. Uh, and the first, I mean, first day we just did the curriculum and we didn't really do any games. But the second or third day, whenever we actually began, we were playing kickball or dodgeball or whatever it was. And, and I got, as did everyone else in the class, very sweaty, uh, very dirty. And every time the... Uh, the gym teacher blew his whistle. I, you know, had this mini heart attack thinking he was going to say, all right, go, go take showers. And, and, you know, I really didn't have any kind of plan. I wasn't bold enough. 
to be a freedom fighter like the, the kids in Chicago. I had no, um, you know, backup idea of how I would avoid it. I was just in dread of it happening. And he never said the word shower. He never suggested that we should. He never said that we had to. He never said that it was maybe a good idea that we should consider it. And you no, know, just a few a few minutes before the bell rang. Uh, probably not enough time, and this is something that was routinely kind of discussed that I've read about uh, in, in subsequent period, really didn't all allow for sufficient time to take a shower. And we all just kind of looked at each other like, oh, okay, uh, well, this isn't going to happen apparently. And, you know, we would change down to our underwear, but that was it. Nobody got naked uh, that I ever saw. And uh, we cake on the deodorant and go to class. And this was first period, so really we should have been showering going to the next class. The hygienic reasons for doing so were perfectly justified, but um, this relatively new, this, this guy had not, he wasn't, he wasn't a brand new teacher in the sense that he was just out of college, he, but he'd been in the administration of the school for you know half a decade or a decade or whatever. Uh, it had been a while since he'd been a teacher, but this was like this, this first or second year as a gym teacher. Uh, and based on what I know, uh, it seems very likely that, you know, this was the first year or two that this was not being required. By the time I got to high school, three or four years later, uh, this was kind of interesting. So this high school was built in at the very end of the 90s, 1999, 1998. Uh, and in that iteration, the culture of showering was still a thing. And so it does have communal showers and it's going to be one of the last buildings, you know, it's going to have those forever. Um, but the policy of requiring kids to do it uh, was gone. By the time I got to high school, it was never mentioned by the actual gym teacher, again, relatively new. Uh, and you just kind of see this progression of uh, policies are mandated. The mandates are terminated at some point. They haven't been terminated everywhere. I've In my travels, I, I've been to areas, to towns that are still requiring this. Right? So if you, if you go to Wyoming or Montana, you might still be able to find this. And also... Um, not it's more common uh, in say like a, a parochial school or a middle uh, a military school. So if you go to uh, St. Paul's school or Amherst or Groton or any of these schools, where, well, the students are living there, so they can't go home and take showers. So logistically, it's much uh, harder for them to avoid. So it's still part of their culture. Having talked to guys who go to those schools or having went to those schools, it's still very much a thing in those schools. Uh, and then. Uh, you have kind of microcultures within school. So maybe all the kids in the gym class are not doing it. Uh, you have this, this middle phase where it's optional but not required. Uh, and depending on the microculture of your school, it might happen, right? So you, you could have a situation where it's not mandated and yet almost everybody is doing it uh, just because that's the cultural norm there. Or you could have it where it's, it's optional and nobody does it. And then you could have selective where gym, maybe gym students aren't doing it and the kids in the pool aren't doing it, but maybe the football team is or the hockey team or the wrestling team or whatnot. Uh, and so there's a pattern of, of those facilities going later or those little microcultures going later. But even that has become increasingly rare. Um, and having talked to a lot of people who did play high school sports, whether it be football, soccer, wrestling, uh, a lot of times, even now, that is not part of the culture. And there's lots of articles of football coaches, for instance, complaining that their students, you know, after practice and they're completely filthy, uh, will not, uh, are, are, are unwilling to shower with each other. So that's a little bit of the of, of the arc of the history there. And in, in my previous video, you know, a lot of people were offering, it's very interesting, what would cause... Again, there wasn't a, a big legal shift. Title Title Nine, you could see how that would affect the pools, but it doesn't necessarily affect the communal showering in the locker room. There certainly wasn't a prohibition there, um, so it's kind of been a big mystery and something that um, you know I still am curious what it was, and, and it's very likely that it's not a single cause here. Um, a lot of people uh, mentioned in the previous video that well. Maybe this is a case of people are, are worried about privacy. They're worried about um, digital surveillance, right? They're, they're worried about people taking pictures of them uh, and then maybe being blackmailed by those photographs. And I, while I think that that's a valid concern, that that's something that can happen and does happen, 
a it's very rare and so you have to it's difficult to uh, uh, assert that something that is unlikely to happen you know is, is the main reason but the other thing is that the shift in the culture predates that by quite a bit so the first smartphones are from what 2007 2008 um, the first cell phones go back 15 20 years before that but they were very rare and you know the first flip phones or whatever did not usually have digital technology of cameras and stuff so um, you know the shift in the 80s and early 90s this is well before people had cameras on their on their phones or even had phones period um, so the shift happened well before that took place uh, the other problem I see with that is uh, teenagers today who have smartphones and most of them do and most of the teenagers who have smartphones are taking digital images of themselves and their friends and they're sharing them right so snapchat instagram whatever like uh, and this is something reason tv has talked about a lot when we talk about like the child porn laws because basically every high schooler or middle even middle schooler in the united states is a felon when it comes to child porn because they have either images of themselves which the law makes no distinction of or they have images of their friends or girlfriends boyfriends whatever on their phones and this has actually hor led to some horrible situations where uh, Reason did an article on a, on a kid who was confronted by a police officer in the school who said, I know you have images of your girlfriend on your phone, and that's child porn, and you could be a felon. And the guy went and committed suicide rather than have to deal with that. Um, but it belies the, the, the idea, like, these people are sharing images uh, with their peers regularly. Um, also, the environment of of a locker room situation it depends on the logistics of that locker room but is not it's not necessarily easily something that could be surreptitiously photographed uh, take it I don't surreptitiously photograph anyone I'm ethically against showing other people but I like to take selfies at the gym and I find it extremely difficult to even do this when I'm taking just a picture of myself because you're exposed there's other people around it's a faux pas my, and my gym doesn't have any kind of no cell phone policy or I've been to gyms that did uh, mine doesn't and yet and, and people are and people do use them like they use them to listen to music people go in the sauna and they bring in their headphones to either uh, to time how long they're gonna be in there or to listen to music while they sit there I don't know how their phones manage it because mine overheats within five minutes but um, it's really not that easy to just go around taking pictures and, and it's pretty clear that if somebody was doing that regularly or even intermittently that they would stand a pretty high risk of getting ostracized caught and excised for whatever reason so but the main reason with that the main argument with that is that the timing just doesn't work the shift away started in the 80s and 90s well be, or really gained ground in the 80s and 90s and goes back to the 70s this is before the digital cell phone culture had really taken over to the point that it's at now now I do think there is a related issue where you have the Instagram uh, society where people are bombarded with these idealized images uh, not just of celebrities but of their friends right the, the, uh, of the people they know people in their classes uh, their peers uh, there's this interconnectivity um, so you know say say you're on a high school hockey team not only you're connected with the members of your hockey team or other people in your school you're probably Facebook friends and Instagram followers with half the other players on the teams of other schools that you interact with to the point where like you're you have a a, a visual familiarity with them that you just probably would not have had in, in days past and so many of these people they have their Instagram they have their Facebook they have their snapchat uh, and they are constantly developing like these or their Twitters or whatever and they're developing these very integrated social networks uh, and image sharing networks and they're constantly comparing each other to each other they're comparing themselves to their peers and then of course there's the whole people are only uploading I mean never mind photoshopping or using filters but you know if you you only upload the images that are the most flattering uh, 
you know, if you if you take a bad selfie, you don't start show it to your friends. If you take a good one, you do. You know, you wait until you're at your absolute lowest weight and your most cut and your abs look the best, and you take a hundred images then. And two months later, when you've gained ten pounds because it's Christmas or whatever, and those abs are gone, those are still the still the persona you put out. And so what I want to talk about now is that I really do think that this is uh, damaging in a lot of ways. And I want to reference here uh, one of my favorite uh, authors who doesn't deal with this directly, but that would be Jonathan Haidt, and in this case, Greg Lukianoff. So here we have the coddling of the American mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. And I think the, the title says it all. Uh, he talks about how... Um, you know, in the wisdom of the ages, you have that Nietzschean quote, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And he points out, well, that's not always literally true. There's things that could not kill you, but de debilitatingly harm you uh, for the rest of your life. Um, but there's this counter narrative now that anything that causes you harm makes you weaker, that you are fragile, and that anything that upsets you, anything that makes you uncomfortable, anything that hurts your feelings, that's actually like a physical harm. And this is something that you could see this process, you know, it's, it's reached new levels now, but you can see this process. If you go back and you look at the, uh, say, the, the gym teachers or the football coaches of the, of the 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, when kids started saying, I'm uncomfortable, I don't, I don't feel comfortable getting naked, it makes, it makes me scared, I just don't want to do it. Getting naked in front of other people is not going to kill you. It's not going to harm you. Um, yes, you might get some, there might be some name calling. It's possible there could be some teasing. It's very likely there'll be some, but it's also very likely that you'll be responsible for some of that yourselves. Um, but you can't just extrapolate the worst possible scenario and then say that's the typical thing that's going to happen all the time. Um, is it possible in today's age that somebody could snap a digital image? Yes, it is possible. It's not particularly likely. What could actually, you know, the worst case scenario, while that does exist, it's the worst case scenario. It's not going to be the average scenario. It's not going to be the typical scenario. Uh, and to go and say, okay, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to, I, I don't want you to feel upset. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. So just go ahead and don't get naked, don't show anything, do the towel dance, don't change, don't just don't do anything at all. Don't take your pants off. Don't let anyone see your butt. Don't let anyone see your dick. Don't don't okay, well, you you've coddled them. You you've sated their 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 fears, their phobias. You've pandered to them. Uh, but you haven't actually helped them at all. You you've you've actually made them more fragile. You've made them more um, psychologically timid uh and there's a whole host of reasons like so the, the whole issue here uh, a body image and this is something i talked about in the previous video a little bit but i think it deserves more more coverage um when you're in a big group of other people and this this is true for men and women um yes it's true that you're exposed and then people can see your flaws they can see maybe you have a small penis maybe you have a weird birthmark maybe you have a mole or maybe you have some love handles or whatever it is maybe you're really obese maybe you're you have gout who knows um but you can see everybody else also and you realize right away that the body beautiful idealized image that is the king of marketing is not reality right you get the you have a warped perspective if you only see people in the best light uh, and their selective imagery, uh, and that's true with the social media. It's even more true if we're talking about the images you see, like in movies or on television or on, in marketing, right? Well, you you only see people with the top one tenth of one percent, you know, who have who have worked themselves into uh, you know the the highest degree of physical perfection that they can, practically speaking. That warps per your perspective on the human body. And the best palliative for that is to go into an environment where you are seeing just the general population, whether it's in your age cohort or other age cohort cohorts, and realizing that's not the case. Uh, and I know when I became a more regular shower goer when I joined a gym four and a half or three and a half years ago, 
Uh, that's one of the first things. It's not like, you know, there would be this gay fantasy that you're going to go and it's going to be just dozens of super hot men who are all super fit and it's going to be a huge orgy for the eyes. And yeah, that happens sometimes, but it's super rare. 99% of the time, it's going to be average, typically older men, but even, even when it's not, you're not getting, you know, perfect physical specimens, however defined. You're seeing every so you're seeing men with gout. You're seeing men with fopa, fat over penis area. You're seeing really hairy guys, really unhairy guys, guys with scars, guys with uh, you know rashes, or um, again like overweight or underweight or too skinny or small penises or whatever else. Uh, and that gives you a perspective on body image that you're just not going to get another way. And that's really valuable, and that really helps you to look at yourself and be like, okay, I'm not so bad. You know, there's a spectrum here, and nobody is going to be on the extreme. Even if you're in the extreme in, in one variable, let's say you are in the top one-tenth of one percent in terms of, um, you know, body weight or body fat percentage, you're not going to be in the shortest one percent or the tallest one percent or in the, you know, so... That's a really valuable perspective to have, and it really can help you to become comfortable with your body and with other people's bodies. you would be less judgmental about yourself and with others, and I think that's really beneficial. But if you have someone say, no, 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 stay, stay hidden, stay concealed, don't look and don't be seen, then you can reinforce all those insecurities that you will have with your body. And that's a big issue for both men and women. I think it's even worse for women. Uh, and uh and the the fact that you treat it like it's something that is uh super secretive and super vulnerable and something that is is a weakness um the fact that you treat it that way and that you are coddled in that belief you know when when the gym teacher tells you oh yeah you're right you know you don't want to be seen naked obviously obviously that's that's too serious of a of a health hazard um then that only reinforces the idea that you shouldn't be exposed and that it's wrong to be exposed. Um, whereas just go out and do it, get it over with, get over it, uh, you'll be fine. And that was the that was the attitude all the way up through the 80s, right? So there were people like, hey, I don't know, I'm not sure I'm 100%, This is, but it was a rite of passage. You would overcome it, your character would grow slightly as a result. And for every person who actually had a genuinely bad experience, say they were actually really horribly hazed, for every person like that, there was innumerable more people who saw character growth. And we can't, uh, we can't ban something or not do something or uh, uh, cater to the, the, the most outlandish fears based on such a minority of experience, right? That's not to say there shouldn't be precautions taken, to help prevent that, or if you want to have policies that say, hey, no phones, hand in your phones before class, uh, you know, no phones in the locker room, blah, blah, blah. That's Those are all totally understandable things to have. If we want to say, well, we, need, we should have monitors, or we should have a buddy program, or we should have a system where, you know, we don't permit uh, certain age groups from other age groups or whatever else, anti-bullying policy. These are all fine. Uh, but to cut off the entire experience is coddling, I think, too much. Then there's another element to this, which is just the, just kind of the uh, socializing that goes on, the fact that you can be relaxed and open with your peers. Um, you know, it's very interesting. The guys at my gym, even though I'm not like friends with them in the sense that I hang out with them or that we socialize together, you know, I see them almost every day. I've seen them almost every day for years, and they have a lot of intimate knowledge about me. Like they can tell if I lost weight, they can tell if I'm sick, they can tell if I've slept or not. I mean, they say, "Hey, you've got bags under your eyes, you don't." Or, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, a lot of guys have been coming up to me and saying, "Hey, you lost a lot of weight. You know, what what have you been doing?" You know, so these are it, that's. I really appreciate that degree of 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 intimacy. Now, this isn't sexual intimacy. These aren't men that I'm sleeping with, that I'm having any kind of contact with. It's just, they see me, I see them, they come, they relax. And it's kind of interesting. It's an inversion of the way most people, younger guys especially, treat it, right? A nudity is, to them is a is a, a period of fraught danger, of, of uh, stress, uh, of something that they're, there's great trepidation that they're terrified about, right? That is scary. Like, like I said, it was my 
biggest fear. This is not something that like literally made me feel like I was going to have a heart attack. And to have that kind of negative, angsty expectation inverted into, hey, this is relaxing. This feels very nice. It's nice to be open. It's nice to not worry about, to not care, to not feel like, you know, that you don't have that feeling that you're being watched, even though people are seeing you, you're in there and it just, it feels nice. And there's a lot, I know there's a lot of guys at my gym and again, these are not, these men are not gay. They're not going to hook up. It's not an orgy. It's nothing like that. It's just, I had a long day at work. I'm stressed. I just want to go and do my workout. And then I want to go and I want to relax. I want to take off my clothes and relax and, you know, sit in the hot tub or the steam room or the sauna. And the, there's other men there who I know and I feel comfortable with. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about politics. Maybe we'll talk about work. Maybe we'll talk about our kids, whatever it is. And that's something that those men really value. And I really value it. And that's a great part of the day. And then you juxtapose that with other guys who are, uh, not willing to be that open, that are terrified, that are scared, that are nervous and angsty, and they will go, they'll, to them, the locker room is like a, it's like an obstacle course where you, you have to try. And, and I remember, I remember this mentality when I was young, when I was a kid thinking like, how am I going to, like I was in swimming lessons and it was like, how am I going to get my swimming suit off and get my clothes on without anybody seeing me naked? And it wasn't easy because the, the facilities weren't set up in that way and you know as as I would be still in my swimming lesson I would be trying to imagine how am I gonna get down there fast enough what am I gonna strategically have to do to make sure that I can never have any of my naked body parts exposed to anybody else um, and now you know I can go and if I go with friends you know I'll be casually chatting with my friends as I disrobe and it doesn't even bother me and the difference in the attitude is is so profound uh and it really kind of i find it uh, you know mildly upsetting and look I'll, I'll i'll admit for those of you who know like obviously i'm gay and like there's obviously a, a certain amount of frustration of curiosity where hey i want to see this guy naked and he won't and it's annoying sure i don't deny that and if i did deny you would all know that i'm lying but that is not the only part of it uh, and there is evidence going back to, you know, the why this happened when it did. I think there is an argument to be made that gay liberation is part of this. Kind of funny, I was just reading, and I'll put a link. Uh, somebody wrote to Aunt Ann Landers back in 1974. A 15-year-old boy wrote, and he was saying, you know, I, I don't want to get naked in front of my schoolmates. I, uh, I wish I could just wear a swimsuit. It seems like an invasion of my privacy. And Ann Landers said... Uh, if you are worried about uh, being seen naked, it's because you really don't want to look at other guys naked because you're probably confused and you're probably gay. Or that was the implication of her response, that uh, if you're nervous about being naked with other guys, that is an indication that you're maybe a little uh, gay. Um, you know, people have always known that there were gay men, if you go back to the 50s and 40s or, or whatever. I think, though, before gay liberation, there was uh, plausible deniability. And you could tell yourself, well, you know, Hank and Aaron and Jake or whoever, they're not gay, so it's fine. And now you can't deny the possibility that there might be someone who's gay. And, uh, you know, some friends have told me, some of my straight friends have told me that, uh, you know, straight men are very uncomfortable with the idea uh, uh, of being seen as a sexual object. They want to be the predator, not the prey. And they feel like a gay man looking at them is making, makes them pray. Now, I would go back to the Jonathan Haidt argument. You know, somebody, uh, let's say it's true, and some homosexual sees you in the locker room uh, and is attracted to you, that is not actually victimizing you at all. Now, if they cross the line and they come over and they start trying to molest you, yes, that crosses the line. But uh, what are the odds of that happening, especially if we're talking about like teenagers who are more than big enough to defend themselves? Um, you know, Again, you can't you can't say, well, this is the absolute worst possible thing that could happen, the most terrible circumstance imaginable, and anything now now the entire uh, experience is typified by that you know however unlikely um, possibility. Uh, if you 
getting seen by a gay man and having him be attracted to you is not hurting you at all. Uh, I've had gay men stare at me in the locker room, and these are men that I was not interested in and who I had no sexual attraction to. And I will admit that sometimes it did make me feel a little uncomfortable, but it didn't hurt me, didn't, didn't cause me any, any damage. Uh, and these creepy old men are not going to come and like try and pull anything uh, with me. And if we did, if they, if they did, you know, that would be a different question and that would be cause for a, a more specific reaction. So again, even if this is not entirely an invalid, you know, fear, there's a possibility that gay men might see you, you know, and I had this discussion. It was interesting. I had a, a buddy, still have a buddy uh, at the gym and he's straight and we would sauna together. We started meeting in the sauna and we would chat and whatever. Cool guy. Just recently got married a year or two ago. And uh, he started complaining about a fag. He said there was a fag. It was, it was kind of funny, actually. We're sitting in the sauna together naked as we do like a couple times a week. And he just looked up at me. I was like, dude, I'm pretty sure there's a faggot here. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, this guy. And he describes this, this guy to me who, you know, I happen to know is gay. And he's like, this guy was following me around everywhere I would, you know, every, when I was working out, every bench I would go to, he'd go on an adjacent bench and he followed me around and he, uh, he, he tried to lose him by taking some back hallways and this guy followed him and he followed him into the steam room and he followed him to the sauna. And of course, I know that this guy is gay. I know who he is. I don't want to come out and say, oh yeah, I know who he is and his name is this and blah, blah, blah. But I just said, well, you have to understand that like, you know, this is a gym, there's hundreds or thousands of members here and like statistically some of them are going to be gay and you know they're some of them are going to be in the locker rooms and if you're getting naked and walking around like they're going to see you and you have to decide whether that's something you're comfortable with or not and um you know if they cross the line if you think that somebody is being too forward or too too uh predatory or however you want to describe it then you know the first thing to do would be to confront them and tell them to back off and that's going to work 99 times out of 100. And if it doesn't, you can go to management and say, hey, this person's giving me problems. Here's what's, ha here's what's happening. And uh, a week later, uh, he told me that this guy followed him into the steam room. And he said, hey, what's the deal? Why are you following me everywhere? And the guy denied it and said, I'm not following you. And But regardless, this argument put a stop to the interactions. Uh, and that's all that was necessary. And for him to have rather just said, well, I'm just never going to use the sauna ever again. This, he particularly liked the saunas for other reasons, but, um, you know, that would, that would have been a shame and an unnecessary uh, thing. Now I've heard stories of, uh, my gym is pretty tame. I've heard stories of gyms that were worse, uh, describing, you know, creepy old men being like vultures hanging around. But again, this is something that's not going to harm you. Uh, it's stuff that can be easily dealt with and it's not always going on. And another, another reason that it's mostly old men is because younger guys have just are from this more recent culture where you don't get, you don't take showers, you don't get naked, uh, that they chronically, uh, hide everything and that they're not comfortable even with their peers. Right. So they, they, you, they might say, oh, that's the old men, but they, they won't do it when they're only with other kids in their high school. Uh, so you know, this is calling, this is uh, denying a, a, what could otherwise be a valuable time to socialize, to get a greater perspective on, on the human life cycle and the human body this is something I always really admired about when I would go to Iceland. You see men in their 80s and 90s and you see little babies and you see teenagers and you see bodybuilders and average people and families and friends and they have a perspective on, on human development that you're just not going to get uh, based on the segregated age cohorts and the near total non nudity of uh, American culture at this point. Um, another thing that's kind of come up again, you know, there was never a law or a, a big national debate about this. This is just something that has been slowly happening. Uh, without any kind of discussion. And that's one of the reasons I feel compelled to make these videos is because there isn't a public discussion about what's going on. And I don't want to, I don't want us to lose something that's potentially very, very valuable uh, without it even being discussed. But I remember uh, one of the towns that I work at in Wyoming, one of my favorite little towns, Gillette, 
Gillette has a beautiful tax funded uh, rec center. Um, an amazing facility, a place that I really enjoy going whenever I visit the area. And uh, I happen to be friends with some of the people who work there, some of the staff. Uh, it's a relatively new facility, and uh, Gillette, and I've, I've alluded to it before, and Gillette, they, that is one of the places they still require uh, showering from seventh grade on. Uh, they have a very old gym teacher there, apparently, who requires all the students to do it, and it shows at the rec center, which is the whole community, right? It's not just high school kids or whatever. It's everybody. Um, not only do you see a, a casual uh, openness that you don't see anywhere else that I've been in the United States, um, it's like culturally ingrained so that you, you, even kids who are too young to be at the age where they're required to shower naked, they know that's an expectation. They associate that with being a mature older uh, you know adult and then they emulate that there so they know if you're 10 you know the 12 and 13 year olds are doing it and you don't want to be like a little kid you want to be like them um, and what's fascinating though is they have their showers are stalls with curtains which people often don't even use or right, very routinely I'll see people just have the curtains open uh, but when I was talking to my friends there they said well you know before we built this you know the old facility, that did have communal. And I said, well, I'm interested. Was that, was there a, an explicit discussion about that decision to switch to stalls over communal when they built this place? And he said, well, you know, we were all happy with the old way it was. And there was nobody in the community, certainly, who was saying, hey, we need to have these stalls. That's a necessary thing. Um, but the company that, the, the design company, the engineering firm that was going to build the place, they said, hey, Privacy is the way of the future uh, because of trans people was, was what they specifically cited, but they just said, no, this is now expected to be a space of privacy. This is a, 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 th 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 there's an expectation that you be covered or potentially covered at all times. Um, and so, you know, the, I mean, they weren't going to raise a big fight about it or make a big fuss. The community were the ones paying for it, so I'm sure they could have gone to the place and say, hey, well, this is what we want, so do it. But there wasn't really a constituency of anyone, even if they liked the open showers, to insist that that would be what, what's built. And so that's not what was built. And so, you know, any schools that are built now or, or gyms that are built now, the chances that they're going to include communal showers uh, are very, very small unless you have uh, somebody who's going to explicitly demand or ask that that be provided, and there just is a constituency. It's too taboo of a subject, even though there's a lot of people who are going to basically nod their heads at almost everything that I've said in this video, who are going to agree, who are going to say, yes, I agree with that, but it's very difficult to speak up about it without putting a red flag. Uh, people are going to immediately become suspicious, um, Right. And so even if you look at these debates, so schools would sometimes school boards would get petitions often from parents, not from the students necessarily saying, you know, end the naked swimming policy or end the communal shower policy. Uh, and it was difficult because any proponents kind of are hamstrung in their arguments because of taboos. Right. If you come out to, hey, be, getting naked together with your friends is good socializing. It's there's there's a certain egalitarianism about that that is valuable. Those arguments are not very politically correct. Uh, they're not really persuasive in what in public discourse. And so some of the strongest things that you could say in favor of communal showers can't be said. Whereas safety, you can you can you can invoke safety infinitely. Now, how say how much how much safety are we talking about and pros and cons and costs? Those are all valid things, but you can always stand on that point. You know, um, we you know we we don't want there to be lawsuits. Now, what are the chances that there be a lawsuit? They're not necessarily. Are, are there measures you could take to mitigate that? Sure, of course, but it's a it's a language. It's a ver it's a verbiage. It's a it's an argument that um, you can make vocally, publicly, and repeatedly. And the counter arguments, it's much harder to do so. So that's one of the reasons that I feel uh, impelled to talk about this, because so few other people are able or willing to do so. And people would be are, are able to, they just choose not to. 
Um, and, you know, even the people who uh, tend to agree that they're fine, it's not a big deal, they don't feel motivated enough to actually, like, agitate to that end. And, you know, I feel like I'm in that position. So, um, and there's other reasons. Uh, you know, I was just doing, I'll put a link. There was a study in England that showed that um, kids are doing, like, the kids who showered were the ones who were better athletes. And there was kind of a chicken, chicken and the egg question here. Uh, were the ones who are better athletes just more comfortable, you know, exposing their bodies? Uh, their research was actually saying no, that it was a case of um, people who were afraid of getting naked would go out of their way to not get sweaty. So you go to gym class and you go, I don't want to have to shower. Uh, and, you know, they would be hygienic, even if there was no policy forcing them to shower, if they got really dirty, the incentive to shower would be strong just personally. So they would basically intentionally, you know, not run very fast, not work very hard, not just just be as unathletic as possible in an attempt to uh, to spare themselves the necessity of showering. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the and the author it was, it was some study of some athletic organization in the UK. Again, I'll put a, I'll put a link to it in the description. Um, and you know, he was saying, well, I think that we should just get rid of the showers and that way you know people won't won't be worried about um you know having to shower because it just won't be an option and then maybe they'll work out harder right so it's all also kind of pay in the context of the whole debate of youth obesity use uh, you know lack of lack of athletic ability and i feel like that is the exact wrong right so you're still coddling it would be better to say okay look these are mandated you're gonna have to work out hard and again, I'm not for public schools and I'm not for mandatory curriculum, but if you're going to have a gym class and you're going to get sweaty and you're going to be in the school environment, then it makes perfect sense to say, hey, you need to be clean. And it's actually a good character building experience for you to get over your inhibitions when it comes to that. It takes one time and you're probably okay. So anyway, I love to hear what people think. This is kind of the only way that I can get any information about it. So if you have managed to watch to the end of this video, Go ahead and put down your thoughts in the comments below, and uh, you know maybe I'll make another video on the topic in less than two years. So, talk to you all later. Bye -bye.